<clears throat> How many of you guys have skied South Peak? <laughs> How many of you guys have carried a GPS for me on South Peak? The only one. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't there when I was there. Yeah, that's fair. I have to come clean. I've actually never skied Saddle Peak, but I spent a lot of time standing in this exact location watching other people ski. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit more about the results that we've gotten from this kind of GPS survey research over the last two years. Uh, and we'll just get right into it. So we kind of have two separate research questions. One, we're going to look at, so we went out, we collected a bunch of GPS tracks, like around 140 tracks. And so our first question is we want to see how people change their travel behavior depending on avalanche hazard. So we're just looking at, for this case, we only have days that are moderate or considerable hazard. And we want to see whether people are changing how they travel with different levels of avalanche hazard. So for that, to answer that question, we use all the GPS points that we collected. Um, and the second question, we kind of bring the survey data in. So we want to know, based on survey responses, how do uh, kind of different human factors influence people's travel behavior. And that, for that data set, we, we kind of use the GPS tracks as a summary. So instead of looking at every single point, we just look at each track and then pair it with the survey from the same participant. So it's a little bit of a different analysis technique. Um, our study area, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, as it apparently. Uh, Saddle Peak. So this is the east face of Saddle Peak, a big avalanche back in 2010. Um, so what we did is just stand on the ridge line. So it's a little hard to see, but we basically would just stand right over here on the boundary line and physically hand out GPSs. People would go ski their run, and then we wait at the bottom near Slushman's Lift and recollect them. So it's a, it's a similar research question to what Andrea is getting at, but we use the method of just going straight to the field and intercepting people directly instead of having volunteer participants. And so we need to analyze people traveling an avalanche train, which involves analyzing the avalanche train itself. And we base that on basically two different uh, GIS layers. One is a digital elevation model, so just a simple uh, raster model that has an elevation for, in this case, every 10 meters. So our resolution is 10 meters and we get an elevation value across our whole Saddle Peak research area. And then the second uh, layer that we used was land cover. So we look at kind of forest density to see, you know, how people are traveling different based on the density of the forest. And we overlaid that with the GPS track. So our GPSs are not fancy, they're just regular Garmin kind of recreational grade. And they have an accuracy of between 5 to 10 meters depending on your sky view. So the denser the forest canopy, the lower the accuracy for the GPSs. <clears throat> Here's some examples of our uh, terrain layers. This conference last year, I showed this slope angle map, and Eric called me out that it didn't look right, which uh, actually ended up saving me a bunch of time because I fixed it before I went through and analyzed all these points, so thanks, Eric. <laughs> um, yeah. This is our updated slope angle raster. So you can see Saddle Peak here, and then the boundary line is a little hard to see, but it's kind of this gray, or the black check there. Everything inside of that is inbounds. And generally, yellows are kind of just barely avalanche strain, so getting that 25, 30 degrees. And then moving towards darker reds, kind of prime avalanche showing around 40 degrees or, or steeper. A couple things to notice here. As you guys know, if you're familiar with the area, there's a large cliff band here right adjacent to the boundary line. And that's a pretty significant feature for our analysis because it really bumps up the risk that people are taking if they're, if they're just kind of sticking to this closest line. Um, you know, they're over this huge train trap. So uh, something that'll be important to look at in a little bit. So in addition to uh, slope angles, we also looked at land cover. So these the gray figures here are just open alpine terrain. The browns and beige are kind of mixed uh, sparse forest. And then the green is fully dense forest. And these variables I'm going through right now are what we use to analyze people's um, travel behavior when we look at every GPS point. So every point has all these variables attached to it. Here we're looking at some downslope curvature. So Reds are areas where the, the downslope, so if you're looking down 
with the fall line, it would be a convex feature, and the greens are more concave features. So again, we can kind of take that cliff area as an example. We have some big convexities right above those cliff bands. And then the last one, it's essentially the same layer, but in this case, we're looking at a cross slope direction. So this is showing kind of the gullies and ridges on Saddle Peak. And another kind of important feature to notice here is coming off of this fall summit, if you make a pretty much ski fall line down this ridge, you're in mostly green and yellow terrain. And that's a really popular run. Um, and it kind of played into our results from our statistical analysis. So otherwise you get any of these red features are kind of goalie features, which could potentially serve as a train trap if you got caught up in an avalanche over there. So those are our terrain, we call them terrain metrics. So we got slope, land cover, and then kind of two different ways to measure slope curvature. And then another kind of terrain analysis that we did is this avalanche terrain evaluation scale. And it's really just a method to summarize all of those other variables. So the two big ones that we use are slope angle and land cover. So depending on um, if it's forest or open, there's these predefined categories that you can, that you can use to create an AIDS map. Uh, these were developed by Canadian researchers and they just break down avalanche terrain as either complex, challenging, or simple. And so we went through this process for just a saddle peak area to get a, a method for um, summarizing each track with one statistic. Depending on how uh, accurate you need your AIDS map to be, you need to verify it with uh, different amounts of ground truthing. So you can see here, if you want to have like a terrain feature scale map, you need to actually go out there and field verify 50 to 100% of your map. Uh, and then that number goes down as your kind of scale of your analysis uh, gets smaller. So here's what that looks like. This is our Saddle Peak map. And I primarily made this just looking at uh, slope angles and land cover. And then I went and Carl and Alex helped me kind of look at some specific paths and get a better sense for tweaking the runouts. Um, we have three of the GPS tracks we collected here as examples. So this one is kind of a football field track. And you can see, so I calculated the percent of the track that's in each class of a stream. So, here in black is the complex terrain, the blue is challenging, and the green is simple. So what we did is, you can see this boundary line track is 100% complex terrain, right? It's all in that black terrain. The second track, kind of going down the center of the bowl, we see 54% in complex terrain, and then this last track down the ridge line is only 40%. And that is the statistic that we end up using to evaluate these, these tracks based on survey variables. So I'll talk about that again later, but just a visual to kind of see how we're analyzing these tracks. So I already hit on this a little bit, but our field methods, we, we started off trying to go out on random days and just collect tracks at a somewhat random sample. But what we found is that it's really variable how many people are up there. So what we ended up needing to do is kind of select days with good ski conditions. The primary things were ski conditions, visibility, and wind. Um, partially because we just didn't want to stand up there in the wind all day on the ridge, <laughs> at least up to a certain point. Um, and if the ski conditions were bad, people just weren't going out there. So we tried to maximize our days and select when we thought there would be more participants. And yeah, we, we just selected a convenient sample. So we just kind of wait up there as people walk by. We'd say, hey, you want to help us out with some snow science and give them a GPS. And uh, it was all volunteer based. But if that person took a GPS, say, in the morning, we wouldn't hand out the same GPS to another person later in the day. So we tried to just get one track from a person per day. And then our survey responses, they completed immediately after they did the GPS track. So they get down, turn the GPS, and then fill out the survey in the field on the way up the ski lift and drop it at the top in a little plastic box. So it was immediately following their, their backcountry run. Here's a little graphic about how that data worked. Uh, it looks like the font got a little funky. But this is our field data collection. And so we ended up with survey data and GPS data. So starting on the right here, the GPS data, we kind of went through this GIS workflow, converted to a shape file, and then we added these eights classes and the train metrics onto each point of the GPS track. So some tracks would maybe have 50 points up to maybe 250. And so for every point along that track, you get 
uh, an AIDS class that you're in, and then all of those train metrics, so slope, angle, land cover, and curvature. And same thing with the surveys, we turned them into numerical data, and then we joined it with some weather station data from Bridger Bowl and uh, the avalanche forecasts. We originally were looking at avalanche problem, but we didn't really end up, we had I think maybe like 90% of our days were wind slab. So that's the nature of Saddle Peak, I guess, and we, so we just went with avalanche forecasts as our variable there. And then in the end, I've mentioned this already, but we ended up with a GPS track data set and a GPS point data set. So what do we find? So first of all, we got about 120 tracks on moderate days and only 20 tracks on considerable days. And our average kind of samples collected per day, we would get 10 tracks a day, more or less, on moderate, uh, and only 3.3 tracks per day on considerable hazard. So we definitely saw overall less people going out the boundary on considerable days. We did some kind of additional research on this and looked if there was a difference in the populations of who was going out on moderate versus considerable. And we didn't find any significant differences. So even though it was a smaller subset of the population of saddle skiers, it wasn't significantly different in, in terms of like experience, education, age, that kind of stuff. And then the results are kind of in three sections. We got demographics from the survey. We have our travel behavior by avalanche hazard and then human factors by the percent of track and complex train. So demographics. Our mean age was about 36 years old, and mean year skiing, 28 years. So most of the folks we saw were, were pretty experienced. Um, and we ended up with a really skewed population, so 90% males and 10% females, um, which is obviously quite different than what Andrea just presented. And that's similar for a lot of research similar to this that's gone on with just traditional backcountry um, populations, they seem to have a larger percentage of females than what we found here. As far as experience, we had 80% self-rated experts, but we only had 50% of people who had taken anything level one or higher avalanche education. So definitely a discrepancy between like self-rated experience and, and formal education. So looking at some of our train analysis, we did uh, what's called a logistic regression for these terrain variables. And the basic idea here is that our response variable is either moderate or considerable hazard. So we're just looking at changes in these uh, terrain metrics, so slope, land cover, cross slope curvature, and down slope curvature. We kind of created these combinations of those variables for each level. So one combination for moderate hazard and one combination for considerable. And then we compared if there were significant differences between those. And what we found was we have significant differences in cross slope curvature. So people are avoiding um, gully features quite a bit under considerable hazard and preferring planar and ridge features. And then in the kind of downslope curvature, so just looking with the fall line, we see people have a negative uh, association with convex. So again, using less convex features under days with considerable hazard. So these are kind of, they're subtle changes because pretty much no matter where you go on, on Saddle Peak, it's, it's avalanche terrain, but they are significant changes in terms of kind of micro terrain selection. Um, we also saw, we had an interaction here with slope angle and, and land cover because, you know, as we all know, it makes a difference if you have, you know, really densely treed area as far as the slope angle that it's going to take to avalanche. So in this case, we saw people generally tending towards more uh, either sparse or treed terrain as opposed to open uh, under elevated avalanche hazard. So to visualize that a little bit, this is a heat map. So what, it, what it's measuring is just the density of GPS tracks uh, in a given area. So in this case, we use like a 30 meter search radius. So if, if a track was within another one within 30 meters, then it would come up as a hotter color on this map. And we can see really strong concentration of tracks along that uh, kind of ridge feature right off this, the sub peak. And also a strong, com uh, strong concentration of tracks right along the boundary line there on the football field. And I'm going to go through a bunch of these maps for the different results that we got. 
And some of the main changes that we see are in this football field area where folks are kind of trending further from the boundary line, which actually, in this case, gets them into safer terrain because they're not exposed to those big cliffs. And here's our considerable track. So another caveat is we have a lot less tracks on these days, but in general, we see a little bit less concentration along the football field and a really concentrated kind of narrow stripe there along the ridge and less kind of widespread. So folks are more or less kind of skiing three or four different lines, whereas in this, people are skiing kind of everywhere. People are, yeah, skiing all over that east face of the saddle. So that's, uh, that's kind of our results from looking at travel behavior by avalanche hazard. So if we now we look at these human factors, so we, we gave a survey, right, and it had about 20 questions on it, all the standard demographics, you know, age, backcountry experience, year skiing, and then also a bunch of specific questions to lift access skiing. So did other people in the area influence your decision making or did you feel rushed by other people in the area? And then questions about rescue and um, avalanche mitigation by the Bridger Bowl Ski Patrol out of bounds. Um, what we found is that these three variables came out as significant. So gender, again, kind of a common theme, uh, backcountry experience, and then people's perception of avalanche mitigation. So for gender, um, we see that female participants uh, generally don't have as much percentage of their track in complex terrain. So kind of to interpret that a little bit, it means they're going a little further away from the boundary line and avoiding that really high consequence terrain near the boundary. This again is based on a pretty small sample. And most of the women that we handed GPSs out to were traveling in a mixed gender group. So it wasn't necessarily exclusively female group decision making. This map looks similar to the moderate track one where we just have a lot of, a lot of track volume. But if we look at the female, it's quite different. So we see barely any use here along the boundary line and a lot of people, pretty much everyone skiing off of the false peak there. If we look at backcountry experience, we see we rated it on this is based on Yordi's ski tracks survey, so we tried to have some consistency there. So novice was little to no experience, intermediate less than five years, and expert is more than five. And what we see is people who rated themselves experts kind of again had a tendency to go further away from the boundary line. And there was people skiing here, but not as much of a concentration when we look at non-experts. So a lot of non-expert skiers or self-rated experts are taking that line closer to the boundary. And then the last thing we found is this perception of avalanche mitigation. So this question was a little wordy, but it's based on your understanding, what degree of avalanche mitigation does the ski area provide for the lift access backcountry terrain you traveled in today? So what we're trying to get at is, do you think they do avalanche control out of bounds? That maybe would have been a better way to word this. But, uh, <laughs> the, so this was evaluated on a five point scale. And so what we did is we compared people who said, no, there's no avalanche control out of bounds to kind of everyone else. And what we see is, again, very similar distribution, really highly concentrated out along this main ridge. And then folks that um, think that they are doing avalanche control out of bounds are more likely just kind of ski these exposed lines over the big uh, set of cliffs there. Okay, so in summary, uh, overall we kind of see a positive response to ele elevated avalanche conditions. So while people are still going out there, we see way less people going out there in considerable hazard, and we see them uh, traveling on, on slightly more defensive terrain. Um, of our original survey questions, so of the kind of human factors we look for, uh, we see that skiers with less experience, males, and people who have kind of a false perception of the avalanche control are more likely to expose themselves to higher risk above that cliff feature. Um, and then one final thing is that we, we do see that uh, only about less than 75% of people carry Beacon Pro Band shovel. So we have almost 30% of people that go out there and don't have all the rescue gear that they would need uh, to facilitate an avalanche rescue if something happened. So it's kind of just an alarming footnote. That's all I got.